Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Son of a Blitch podcast. I'm your host, George Blitch. Today, I got to have a wonderful conversation with Mark Kenyon. For those who are unfamiliar, Mark Kenyon has been a leading voice in the outdoor industry for quite some time. In the late 2000s, he put together a website called Wired to Hunt, which became a premier spot about all things whitetail deer hunting, uh, strategies, information, their habitat. Uh, he was putting out blogs. He was filming some episodes of, of his hunts. And then that kind of grew to um, him emerging into the podcast space as one of the leading podcasters in the outdoor industry. Wired to Hunt has been around since 2014. Uh, this podcast is about to hit its 700th episode this fall. Um, they're putting out three a week now. Uh, there is so much going on there. Some wonderful people. His guest lists have just been phenomenal. And, and it's no wonder that that grew to get him some more attention, where eventually, uh, you know, he crossed paths with Stephen Ranella from Meat Eater, and they uh, decided to do some work together. They brought Mark into the fold, and he became a Meat Eater crew member. And since he has been a part of the television show episodes, podcasts, and they've done a bunch of films um, that are kind of underneath that meat eater umbrella, the back 40, uh, there's buck country. Uh, there's going to be one week in November. There's so much that that Mark's been uh, involved with, with that. Um, it's kind of hard to keep track, but he lists it all out here in this podcast. Um, and we talk a lot about his book as well that he's put out. Um, that wild country. It's a, it's one of my favorite books. Uh, got it here behind me. You guys, I think if you haven't read this, uh, it's going to be one that I think you're going to love. I read it in one day. It is a page turner. Talks about chronicling his trips through a bunch of different public lands here and the historical context of each one, um, how we got to have these public lands. You know, talks about that, the past, the present, and the future, what we need to do and why we need to preserve these amazing public spaces for future generations to enjoy here in the U.S. Uh, Mark is just a wonderful, wonderful person. Uh, I really, really was honored to have him on the podcast today. I've been following his career for quite some time, um, and he's someone I definitely admire. I love his voice for the outdoors, all the things he's doing um, to try to bring about awareness of our habitat and what we need to do um, to preserve that. And great conversationalist, uh, great conservationist, and man, we just had a good time chatting today. So without further ado, enjoy this podcast with Mark Kenyon. I know I did. Hope you do, too. Take care. Hey, Mark, how you doing today? I'm um, great. Thanks for having me. And thanks for coming on. Hey, I kind of figured we can start with maybe the genesis of your hunting days. Walk me back to where you grew up, when you started hunting, who brought you to the outdoors, and uh, who got you involved with, you know, your love of whitetail deer and all things hunting. Sure. Uh, well, I'll try to keep it really high level and quick, and then you just tell me wherever you want to drill down and spend some more time. Um but the story started as, you know, as far back as I can remember. Um, probably age three is when I went to deer camp for the first time and it's continued coming ever since. So my my grandpa, kind of the patriarch of the family, and then my father grew up underneath him learning to hunt and fish. And, and that's just kind of what our family always did. Um, so that was in Michigan. And, you know, we always go up to our cabin every fall hunting uh, for gun season, fishing all summer, various lakes, and rivers across the state. Um, so I kind of had that throughout my whole childhood and then fast forward into, you know, my early adult years, I kind of took it to the next level. So once I kind of jumped off from home base, I would say like my early years, it was, um, what I kind of refer to as like domesticated outdoors activities. You know, we, we go to deer camp, but it was like, you go for opening weekend and you sit next to a tree or uh, you go out in the boat, but if you didn't catch any fish, grandpa would be like, well, at least you don't need to clean any. Um, it was like that kind of thing. So we were very like, we were into the culture of it. We did it a lot, but I wouldn't say we did it terribly successfully too often. <laughs> um, and then once I got through college, um, you know, in high school, I remember I was really trying to start figuring out things, you know, above and beyond the basics that I've been taught. Um, and then once college came around and got out of college, then I got really, really deep into it and started figuring things out. And it, and it went from just a fun thing I did at certain parts of the year to like my life, um, so that's that's kind of a very, very quick version of what that trajectory looked like. It was always a family thing. Um, brought my my dad, my grandpa, my uncles and I and cousins together. And so it was a, was a very formative part of my life experience. And um, and now it's even even more so. 
Well, you're still working at that same deer camp. Is that correct? Some of the videos I've seen recently where you're doing a bunch of improvements, that's there at that family deer camp? Yeah, that's true. That's that's the place. That was where I, that place kind of made me who I am. So it holds a really special place in my heart. And uh, so it's great to be going back up there now. It's it's kind of um, changed over the years as the habitat has changed in that surrounding area. The deer population, you know, went down dramatically in the kind of 2000s, I guess. Uh, but in recent years, like you mentioned, we've been trying to do some things to try to bring it back and get the hunting back up there again. Um, I would say like the heydays of our deer camp were in the 90s, maybe. And then since then, both the deer population and the number of hunters that would come up were in decline for maybe 20 years. And uh, now we're hoping to get back on the upswing. But uh, it's always been an amazing place to spend time and and cherish, you know, those relationships. And And now hopefully we'll have the deer hunting to match the good times. Indeed. Well, talk to me a little bit about the idea too, because now, you know, you've got kiddos, you're bringing in that next generation of hunters there. What does that feel like and look like for you when you're going in there and you're bringing them uh, with you? It's the coolest thing. I mean, it is, uh, it's bizarre to, you know, take my son up there and and see his, the glimmer in his eyes and the excitement he has when he looks at the wall with all the antlers or when he asked my dad for another story and another story and another story. And I can so clearly remember myself in those shoes. Like I remember sitting in the back of the, uh, the Explorer that my grandpa had driving up to deer camp. And one of the guys who's probably in his twenties at the time would sit in the back with me. And I would just ask him for story after story after story. And I thought he was the coolest person in the world. Cause he'd killed like three bucks and he killed that big eight pointer in the swamp. And so I just, I couldn't get enough of whatever he would tell me. And and now I see my five-year-old son doing the same thing. And so it's, it's just so, so great to see. So exciting. Um, and what's been, you know, particularly um, enjoyable uh, for lack of a better term, just great is that he has that same love. Like I can see both of my kids now, my three years. So Everett's my oldest, he's five mm-hmm. and he's like hook, line and sinker insane about hunting and fishing. And now my three-year-old Colt, um, is starting to really pick that up too. So they're both, um, they're both into shooting their bows and fishing and hiking and camping. And, you know, I think we camped with them like 25 nights this summer. Um, and they love it. Like we finished a backpacking trip and we got home and Everett wanted to bring his sleeping bag inside. He slept underneath his bed in his sleeping bag. Cause he wanted to feel like he was tent camping again. Um, so That's the kids awesome. are, the kids are ate up with it and it's uh, it's really cool to see. So take me back to when you're talking about how there's kind of been a change with deer in that area too. You talked about a decline uh, in numbers. What was the cause of that in in that area? Yeah, I'm sure it's multifaceted um, and I don't know everything that's going on, but the biggest thing I think has been a change in um, likely in logging practices there. So we've got this 40 acres that our family owns that my grandpa bought 36 years ago or something. Um, and that is tucked into like thousands of acres of public land, state land. And that land was pretty, uh, aggressively logged in the past. And I think that did a couple of things. The biggest thing being it made a whole lot of great food for deer. So there's a whole lot of edge, a lot of great bedding, a lot of great, um, forage. And as a lot of that forest has matured, now you have just a whole lot more big old mature forest where there's very little understory. So very little food, very little cover. Um, and already you've got a Northern, this is in the Northern part of the state. So there's already tough winters, tough habitat. There's not a lot of ag, almost no ag in the area. So they don't have those types of food sources. They don't, they have tough environmental conditions. So if you take away the logging, which created essentially ag fields, but by way of native vegetation, um, there just isn't the, the food to support a lot of deer. Um, so you take that out of the equation. I think that was a big part of why populations dropped, um, And then I think another thing, you know, and this wasn't so much a habitat thing, but maybe just like a cultural thing back in the eighties and nineties, um, there was a lot more hunters up there and a lot of hunters with low standards. And so with that being the case, like there was just deer being pushed all over the place and hunters were shooting everything. And so there was a lot of people up there, they were all pushing deer around. And so our family would have like three or four bucks on the buck pole and they're a bunch of, you know, they're one-year-olds and two-year-olds, but everyone was thrilled about that. Um, and there's hunters walking over the state land. So there's a lot of stuff going on, but as those, as the forest matured, deer populations started going down as deer populations started going down, then hunter numbers started going down. So when you stopped having hunters pushing deer around and you have fewer deer around, and then you've got 
you know, my family, which maybe just had not updated their hunting tactics, um, that led to like a, a long period of time where like our strategies were not matching the new reality on the ground. So we went through like a 20 year period there where like two deer were killed um, or whatever it was and, you know, all sorts of other things. But, um, but that I think is, is part of what was going on. So now what's happening is, is we, and then actually a lot of neighbors um, are now all starting to realize, okay, we can improve things. So there's a lot more people now, you know, managing their timber. Um, there's people now planting food plots, creating openings, getting some ag out there. So there's a lot more food in the ground. I think we're starting to see the, the bounce back of, of larger deer populations. Um, a number of years ago, there were antler point restrictions put in place in this part of Michigan, which I think has helped a little bit to get some younger bucks through. Um, and so, so yeah, all of those things are pointing in the right direction. So uh, we're excited to see you know how this year goes. We're, we're more prepared than ever before this year. Uh, we've done more good work up there than ever. And uh, I'm very excited about it. That's great. Now, is this going to be mainly a bow hunting spot for you? Is there, I mean, 40 acres, are you doing any rifle hunting, muzzle loader? Is there anything going on like that? Or is it kind of strictly you're up in a tree? So it, it'll it be a little both. Yeah. Um, the plan is we're actually, I'm actually going to do a, we're going to make a film up there this year in October um, with me helping my dad try to kill his first deer with a archer equipment up there. So cool. really all of the work we did, all the setup I did this summer has all been setting up for him um, to help him get a deer up there. And so, so yeah, we've got four different setups created with him with ground blinds and these different food plots and different um, timber work we did kind of set up for like a late October bow hunt. Um, but then I'll be going back for gun season and maybe a late season muzzle or hunt or something with my boys. And, um, and we'll certainly do some gun hunting up there too, but it's uh you know, it's small, it's 40 acres, but what's nice is that there is the public land that we're adjacent to. So, you know, I grew up hunting that public land more than I hunted our actual 40 acres. I never hunted our 40 acres. My, my grandpa hunted one part of the 40 acres. Well, grandpa kind of claimed all the 40 acres and then the rest <laughs> of us won the public land. Now that I think about it. Um, so, so now it's, it's a little different now, but, um, but yeah, we're making some small changes on a portion of our private and, um, it's nice though, to be able to roam around and explore that public as well. Sure. Well, you know, speaking of public lands and exploring and making, you know, a, a lot of the different changes and, and upgrades around that area, you've been doing the working for wildlife tour um, out in public lands. I know that I just talked with uh, Lindsey Thomas Jr. with National Deer Association, and we kind of chatted a little bit about that and, and some of the work you're doing there in that tour. Can you go ahead and expand on exactly what all you're doing? I know you have a couple dates left. You've already done some. Maybe if you can kind of give us a little review on, on what you've done so far and what the main goals of of that uh, working for wildlife tour really is sure well i think there's a there's a few things going on and, and one thing i think that i've noticed is that it's easy as someone who cares about wildlife as someone who cares about public lands as someone who um, goes out and enjoys those things um, if you pay attention to the news these days or you know recent years there's there's plenty of bad news about what's going on with this critter here this species here this piece of public land there this environmental catastrophe um, here, there's there's plenty of bad news out there. And it's easy sometimes to get disheartened, like, geez, everything's going to hell. Um, and whenever I find myself getting bummed out about something like that or worried about some new bill in Congress that's going to be bad for hunting or bad for deer, or bad for public lands, whatever it is, uh, I try to remind myself that the greatest cure for depression is action. Yep. And so with that in mind, I've personally been trying to find more ways to personally take action in support of the things I care about and also how to encourage or help inform or inspire other people to do that too. And so that is kind of the context for what then led me to the idea for the working for wildlife tour, which is that when it comes to taking action for hunters and anglers for the places we care about, um, you know, there are opportunities to take action, to protect public lands, to improve public lands, to do something good for deer, fish, critters of all kinds. Um, there's a lot of public land volunteer events out there, but they don't get a lot of publicity. You don't really hear about them unless you're very tapped into the specific organization that's doing it. Um, and I got to thinking like, geez, there's all these events all over the place, but they don't get attended very well. Not a lot of people know about them. Um, what if I could figure out a way to shine a spotlight on that and help people realize like, hey, there, there's some good things going on and it's fun to be a part of it. And, and here's how to do it, or here's where to find information, or here's an opportunity to do it. So 
I launched the Working for Wildlife tour, which was a tour that I went on this year and am going on this year where I'm visiting and shining a spotlight on six different public land volunteer days across the country that I am going to and participating in myself and encouraging folks in those regions to come on out and join me, to come out and let's work on this piece of public land in Massachusetts, or let's go up to this part of Northern Idaho, or let's meet up in Missouri. Let's do something good on the ground today that's going to make the land better for deer or turkeys or fish or quail or whatever it is. And we're going to do it. We're having a good time. We're going to spend some time afterwards, socialize and have a beer, tell some stories, take some pictures, whatever it is, and, and really celebrate this shared love that we have for hunting and fishing in the outdoors and do some good stuff at the same time. And so the tour is, is just a way to um, to tell that story to a larger audience, hopefully, and inspire and encourage people to to participate in that. And if they can't make it to those six events, maybe this will bring the idea to their attention and they'll want to find something else in their neck of the woods to, to be a part of as well. So we've done four. There's two more coming up. There's one on September 23rd in Mississippi and another one on October 15th in Kentucky. Um, those will be really fun events and, uh, and it's been a blast. Do you see yourself doing this next year and kind of continuing on this as a tradition and kind of like a, a yearly tour? Yeah, you know, I'm hoping that it's something we can expand next year mm -hmm. to um, to not involve just myself, but hopefully some other folks on the mediator team. Yeah. Um, I, I probably can't do um, all of them, uh, mm -hmm. you know, being it's gone six extra weekends on top of all my other uh, hunting work travel has been hard. Um, so I'm hoping I can get some backup and get some support so we can kind of spread it out and hopefully do more events total next year. Um, so there's more opportunities for people to participate and, you know, meet other folks from the media team and meet more folks, you know, that like to do the same things that you do. That's been a big thing. Like at all these events I've been to, um, you always talk to people afterwards, like, oh man, this is just so great. I didn't realize that this guy lived 10 minutes from me and this girl is, you know, in the same neighborhood and these folks all hunt the same public land I do. And now we're getting to talk to each other and wow, we're going to go out shooting together. Let's go fishing and you meet so many new friends and make new connections um, through these shared you know, passions that we have, but you just need those opportunities to connect. And this kind of thing is a great opportunity to make those connections. No, it really sounds like it, man. It brings a lot of the similar minded folks together. And, you know, you never know what can build from that. You're talking about working with your neighbors and improvements on your, you know, adjacent properties. And then you get people around that. You never know. It's a wildlife management, you know, association of, of all these folks and can just build. So it's, it's definitely wonderful yeah. to see those kinds of things come together, man. That's, it's a great, yeah. uh, you know, great pinch point for getting those folks. And, you know, yeah, I kind of wanted fun. to, while we're talking about public land, you know, you wrote a book, That Wild Country, Epic Journey Through Past, Present, and Future of America's Public Lands. And I wanted to just kind of talk about the the idea of when you decided to create this book. And if you can kind of walk through people who may not be familiar, um, what all it entails, uh, you know, also where people can get it. And, you know, what was your you know, what was your mission with writing that and um, kind of what was it that you wanted to leave uh, behind with that reader as far as, you know, kind of maybe some action items or, or you know, what that you wanted them to absorb when you wrote that? Sure. So, you know, at the time that this all came together, um, I was running Wired to Hunt, which was a deer hunting website and a Wired a deer hunting podcast and YouTube channel, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I, I talked about a number of different conservation topics um, within the sphere of the deer hunting world across those platforms. Um, but I was feeling a growing need to try to do something more, to try to make more of a positive impact when it came to these things that I cared so much about, kind of going back to these themes that we talked about earlier. Um, and as I was feeling that pull to like figure out how can I do more, um, there was also this growing threat to public lands. And public lands were something that I've, you know, my whole life loved, but didn't necessarily understand a whole lot about. Um, but I was now learning, excuse me, I was now learning that these places that I grew up hunting, these places that I've fallen in love with as an adult, exploring, hiking, backpacking, climbing, whatever, these national parks or forests or wilderness areas, um, there were serious threats to them. These places were not guaranteed forever. Um, these places could be taken away or they could be degraded. Um, these opportunities might not be there for my kids or grandkids Um unless we stop some of these things. And so as I was realizing that, and as I was having this inner desire to do something more, um, I, I saw an opportunity to kind of mer merge those two things. So seeing there's this threat to public lands, which I care about so much, and I have this desire to do more of a positive, be more of a positive um, 
uh, have a positive role in this landscape of the hunting and fishing and, and outdoor world. Um, and then third, I love books. I've always wanted to write a book. And that was something that had been um, kind of on the to-do list. Someday I wanted to write a book. Um, I saw that this would be the perfect opportunity to do that. As I personally wanted to learn more about public lands, I, I'd use them, but I never understood how we got them. I never understood what it took to get to this point or how they're managed or um, any of that, that led us up to this point. Um, so I had this personal passion to try to figure that stuff out and explore it myself. And also simultaneously re, uh, realizing that if we want to stop these threats, if we want to keep these places around, I'm not the only one who has to learn about this stuff. We need to get the general public to really get up to speed on all this, because mm -hmm. if I don't understand the context, being someone who's like very tapped into this and whose career it is to be involved with the outdoors and public lands, there's probably a whole lot of people who have zero idea other than the fact that, like, oh, Yellowstone's a place. And I went there once and saw bear. So, so that was the impetus for the idea for the book. That's why I, I wanted to write it. And this was, you know, somewhere in that like 2016 ish time period, I think when that was all coming together. And then it was you know, a years long process of getting a book agent and a book deal, and then going out and doing all the trips and doing all the writing and research and all that kind of stuff. Um, but the book itself is, as you mentioned, it's about um, it's about the past, that being like how we got our public lands, what this whole journey was that that led America to having, you know, more than 600 million acres of federal public lands and hundreds of millions more acres of state and county public lands. So how we got to have these things, how are they managed? What's the controversy? Or why are they controversial in some ways? Um, how do they get taken care of? Who's responsible for them? And then all that leading up to where are we now? Like what's going on with them now? What are the threats facing these places now? What does the future look like for these places? Um, and so that was like the the informational narrative of the or through line of the book. But to explore those topics, I wanted to ground them in personal experiences. So I decided to go out and travel the country and explore these public places myself, um, hiking, backpacking, rafting, hunting, fishing, doing all sorts of crazy stuff out on these places um, and really, you know, ground truthing the things that I was talking about in the book. So the book is a series of public land adventures through which you learn about the past, present, and future of our public lands. Well, it's a phenomenal book, man. I mean, it it was I, I I literally read it in one night. I was just opening it up. I was fascinated. I loved the historical nature of, of a lot of the educational things that came about. I, I loved your thread of going through there and you with your wife and different journeys you guys took, fly fish. I, I could put myself in all these pictures um, and these great places all across the country and I just found it to be a fascinating read. I'm, I'm really excited you wrote it. And I think that uh, anybody who wants to learn more about public land, and especially the history, and just read also a fun book. I mean, it's just, it's a it's a neat uh, journey to take with you. And um, where is the best place for, for folks to get that? Is there, are you selling that on your site? Is that on Meat Eater site as well? Yes. Yeah, so Amazon is the mm -hmm. easiest place probably. Uh, but Meat Eater, the Meat Eater store does sometimes have signed copies. And mm -hmm. I think we still have some signed copies in stock. So if you want an autograph version, check the Meat Eater store. They might still have them. If not, Amazon uh, is the go-to. Cool. And I now speaking of kind of like the idea, and I was thinking about your website, I mentioned Wired to Hunt. And I, and I was kind of probably maybe should have led with that in, in the idea of kind of giving a, a chronological order. But you started this site and then also your podcast. I know your podcast, you started in 2014, kind of talking about your 2013 season. So, you know, you're kind of in your, you're that 10th year here working on that. And um, when did you start the website and kind of, did you have a background in, uh, you know, it, your journalistic ways and writing? Like, cause you obviously are, are a wonderful writer. And I just kind of, I was curious about that transition of like, you know, you're in college and you're, you're then you're out and then, you know, this, the trajectory of kind of getting into this outdoor space and, and being a, a leading voice in it these days. So I was just kind of curious about how that formed and when that idea was like, I'm going to take this to that next level and, you know, produce a site and blogs and, and podcasts and such. Yeah. So, um, I did not have a background in this stuff, actually. Um, I, as I said, grew up loving hunting fish, the website the Wired Hunt idea came about when I was in college. Uh, I was in an internship between my junior and senior year of college, and it was an advertising agency that I was working for in New York City. So I'm in Manhattan, living in a dorm room of Columbia University, um, as far away as you can get from the wilderness and uh, hunting and fishing, and miserable. 
And like, I'm just wishing I was outside doing the stuff I love, but instead I'm in the concrete jungle, can't do this kind of stuff. And my job at this ad agency was working with bloggers to try to like promote our clients' products on their blogs. So this is back in 2008. Okay. And I'm realizing like, man, there's this, like, this is right when like people were just dabbling with Twitter and that Facebook was just kind of beginning and Instagram wasn't even around yet, I don't think. Yeah. Um, and so it was very early days for all that kind of stuff. But I was like, you know what? Well, I could start a blog and I could write about deer hunting. And then I maybe that's a way I could like scratch my itch. So I started it that summer just as like a passion project to keep me busy and keep me engaged with deer hunting while I couldn't do it. Um, fast forward one year and now I graduate college and I take a job um, at a big tech company based in Silicon Valley. And I am shipped out there to work that fall in California. And again, kind of same thing. I'm in the concrete jungle. I can't hunt. It's hunting season. I'm miserable working at this tech company. I'm like, what am I doing? You should have found some way to work in the hunting and fishing world. Um, you got to go back to Wired to Hunt and pick that back up. So it's September of 20, 2009 now, and I'm jumping back into Wired to Hunt. And I read a book called Crush It, which is all about how to build a career out of your passion. And I finished that book in one night, kind of like you read mine. And I said, that's what I'm doing with Wired to Hunt. So it would have been probably like September of 2009. I said, I'm going to find some way to make a living doing this thing that I love. I'm going to build Wired to Hunt into some kind of brand that can can support my passion and explore these things. And from that point on, just worked my tail off nights and mornings and weekends. Um, I didn't do much in California. I just worked on Wired to Hunt because that was more fun than going to an art museum or something in San Francisco. And um, and that's how Wired Hunt really started. And so it was a website, you know, for a number of years and social media, and then started filming hunts and doing videos in like 2010 or 11, probably. So the YouTube channel. And then like you mentioned, in 14, I launched the podcast. Um, and so I was, it, I guess it would have been the year prior. 2013 is when I quit my day job and went full-time with it. So uh, for four years, did it on the side with the day job. And then after that, quit in 13 and went full time and did that for another five years or something until the whole mediator thing came together. So how did that come together? How did you, was it, was you and Steve kind of connecting some other folks? Like, how did you become a part of, you know, that mediator team? Yeah. So, so Steve and I had connected at some different events over those years between 13 and 17. Um, he was speaking at a national deer association event that I was at. We got, had some drinks and talked and he actually helped connect me with the person who eventually became my uh, publishing agent. Um, so he had some familiarity with my work. Um, and I guess that all started because I cold called him or cold emailed him and asked to produce a podcast for him. I was like, Hey man, I've got a very successful hunting podcast you're great on Joe Rogan. You should have a podcast. Um, I just, you know, I, I tried to show him all the things I'm doing to make myself seem like I was worthy of his time. And uh, fortunately he was kind of aware of what I was doing already, but he's like, Hey man, I appreciate it, but we're already doing a podcast. It's already in the works. Um, hasn't been released yet, but we're already doing it. Um, but let's stay in touch. And so that's kind of how the relationship started. And then, you know, years later, um, he just called me out of the blue. I was in Grand Teton National Park uh, with my wife. I think we were like on one of these trips that ended up in the book. And um, he called me and said, hey, man, what are you doing first week of September? Well, I'm planning on deer hunting in Montana. He's like, well, I think you should go to Alaska instead and go caribou hunting with me. Um, I was like, wow, okay, great. And then uh, so he springs that on me. And then he calls me back the next day and says, oh, by the way, I'm also taking media there from just a TV show. And I'm going to make it into like a larger network with a whole bunch of like other people that do this kind of stuff. And I want you to be one of those people to do it with me. Um, and so this was the fall of 2017. Um, and so over the course of that fall, we had a lot more conversations. And I went to Seattle and met with him and we talked about it. And this was before it was a thing yet. It was just Steve and the folks at the venture comp uh, capital firm mm -hmm. and like Giannis. And um, long story short, by winter of 2018, I decided to do it. So that effectively meant merging Wired to Hunt into Meat Eater and making, you know, Wired to Hunt like a, a subsidiary under the Meat Eater umbrella. And that was, you know, more than five years ago now, approaching six. Wow. Oh, man, it's it's been a good run and it continues to be, man. I'm, I'm excited to see all the the growth from that team and all the amazing people that are coming aboard. And, you know, you you had a standalone 
um, audience and everything too. But I'm sure that, you know, being a part of that kind of amplified it even more. So um, yeah. you know, congratulations on that as well. And when you Thank talked you. about that caribou hunt, was that the one that Doug was a part of as well? Yeah. yeah that's okay. The one. Okay. I figured as much as I, like, I, I don't know how many times y'all gone out, but so that was your first time, I guess, on film with them then? Yeah. Yes, it was. Cool. Yeah, and was how quite many? The, quite the experience. That was that was Doug. He still tells me about that and how amazing that that trip was for him and you know a lot of the personal connections he had there too. And uh, I was kind of curious too with that. How many times now have you been on uh, an an episode of, of as far as the you know the the show itself? So we filmed um, that Alaskan hunt, which was two episodes, and then we filmed a coos deer hunt in Mexico, which is two episodes. And then we filmed a Michigan deer hunt that actually never made it on TV because it just didn't go very well. Um, and then that would be the extent of the meteor proper Netflix. And then we've done a bunch of YouTube stuff, of course, right. um, with Steve and, and others and then my own shows. And let's talk about the one that you were part of too, the back 40. Um, can you tell people about what that was? Because I know at the very end, I mean, you, you kind of guys donated that land that was purchased and uh, let's talk about that and where that ended up and what your goal was with that. Cause I know there was also some collaboration there. I know Doug came on as well and um, yeah. you know, Steve and everybody else there. Yeah. So the first show that I hosted for Mediator um, was called back 40. And the idea was to buy a little kind of raw farm in Southern Michigan um, that had been farmed kind of to the bones for decades and see if we could take this place and rebuild it into like a wildlife paradise. If we could approach the management of this property, not just as a, a big buck factory, but also how do we think about this more holistically and focus on the larger biodiversity story? How can we make this place great, not just for bucks, but also pollinators, native species, uh, turkeys, songbirds, small mammals, um, soil quality, microbes in your soil. How do you really look at the whole thing? Um, because there's a lot more out there than just deer. And it's all connected. And so that was a story we wanted to explore in tandem with this idea of, of sharing a landscape and helping educate new people. So the idea of the show was to document the story of rebuilding this property while also bringing different people out to it to either uh, share their insights about it so I could learn from them or to share my insights with newer hunters. So you mentioned we brought Doug out to the farm. We brought, you know, birders. We brought be experts. We brought, um, you know, land consultants of all sorts of different types, Jeff Sturgis, Jake Elinger, Doug Duran. Um, we brought, um, plant biologists. We brought, I can't even remember a whole bunch of different people. And then also a handful of different new hunters who then I was show showcasing like, Hey, this is, this is, you know, we're teaching them about the habitat. We're teaching them about the deer behavior. We're teaching them about hunting. And so there's this kind of tandem storyline there. And so for two seasons, we did that. We, we worked on the property. We documented that story of building the property and then also hunting it with other folks and myself. Um, and then after two years of doing that, we donated the farm to the National Deer Association for use as a new hunter, new hunter education space. And so in the three subsequent years, um, the National Deer Association has had a group of volunteers who continue to go out to the property and improve and manage that habitat. But then also each year we run a field to fork program, which is the NDA's new hunter mentorship program. So each year in the summer, we get out there with a bunch of volunteers and we bring in like 12 to 15 new hunters and we partner them with a mentor and we spend a full day or two viewing various educational things, shooting crossbows, shooting rifles, touring the property, learning about how deer use the property, learning about how to set up and hunt them. And so that's in the summer and then they come back for a hunt in September and uh, they get partnered with their mentor and get to have, you know, a two day hunt and, uh, you know, experience with that mentor. And, you know, I think more than, a, well, probably close to like two dozen people or something like that have been out there, maybe more than that now have been out there. And I think something like a dozen have killed their first deer there on the property. Um, and now there's a whole new batch of another 12 or 14 this year that we're getting ready to head out with in a couple of weeks. Um, so it's been really cool to see not just the, the show, um, do what it did. But the coolest thing has really been um, the long-term effects and seeing all these you know, dozens of new people who've got to be introduced to hunting through that property. And, you know, there's been a couple examples where two of the guys that I mentored the first year, um, I was with both of them when they killed their first deer. 
And they connected with each other because they're like, oh, we were both, you know, mentees of Mark. So they developed a, like a friendship between the two of them and started trying to continue learning to hunt together. Um, and we've stayed in touch. And now this year they're coming back now as mentors. So now they're actually mentoring new hunters themselves. So it's been really cool to see that kind of full circle thing happen. And uh, it was a really cool project. That It sounds it, man. It, it's been, it was a neat one to follow. And, uh, you know, there's some other, you know, kind of, it's, it's a subset of the show. It's these, you know, kind of smaller, uh, you know, as far as publications that, that are going on in productions and you've got some other ones that are going on too. I know you got, you know, one week in November, uh, rut fresh Ra- rut fresh radio. Uh, if you can kind of talk about some of these, you know, that you're doing outside of, of the wired to hunt podcast, what are some of these, uh, you know, shows and kind of, you know, feature podcasts that you're going to be doing here in this fall? Yeah. So there's a lot to keep track of. Um, I know. I was curious about so, how you do that too. That's let, let's start with that. Like, how are you able, cause you're spitting off dates. Like you remember them. I don't know. Is there a calendar on the other side of the screen or is this all in your brain here? Like, how are you able to keep track of all that you got going on? It's all in the brain. Um, as far as dates, uh, although I do say I live and breathe with a, a planner. So yes. I do have everything, uh, daily planner, and then uh, the Google calendar for the long-term stuff. If I don't gotcha. write it down, I will forget it as far as upcoming <laughs> things. That's for sure. Same here. Um, but yeah, we, we've got a lot of different projects in the works and we've done a lot of cool things over the years. And it's fun. You know, one of the great things about Meat Eater is that we have a great team of people and resources to try things. So if we've got a cool idea, they'll oftentimes say, all right, just go do it. And they'll give you the resources and the people you need to go do that. So the back 40 is a perfect example. We were able to buy a farm. Um, and that wasn't my own money. That was, that was company money to buy a farm and do this thing. And then we didn't sell it and make a profit. We just gave it to a conservation organization. Right. Um, that's pretty special. So that was cool. So the back 40 was that first show. Um, I filmed another show. We've done two seasons of one week in November. Mm -hmm. Um, so all these shows are on the meat eater YouTube channel. That's where they premiere and that's where they still live. And then reruns also run on the sportsman channel. And I think outdoor channels as well. Um, but so the second show is called one week in November, and that is a pretty cool show where we document one single week. The whole season of the show is just one week of hunting in November, uh, seven episodes cover seven days. So the first episode is November one, second episode is November two, and you're following along with myself and, uh, several other hunters. There was three other hunters in the first year. And now in season two, which comes out possibly this week, um, I think there's five of us total. So it's myself. So this year's uh, show will be myself. Tony Peterson, Spencer Newharth, Clay Newcomb, and Giannis Bertellis. Um, and so you're you're getting to see every day of our hunt across the country, right? So I'm in Nebraska, Giannis is in Wisconsin, Clay's in Oklahoma, Spencer's in Wyoming, so on. And so you're getting to see this picture of what the rut looks like across the country on the very same day, but in wildly different places. And you follow us day by day. So like I mentioned, season one's already out. Season two comes out here in a matter of days. Um so that's one. And then another show I did, which was a single season run, but a pretty cool one. It's called Deer Country. Mm-hmm. And that was a six or seven episode series um, where I went to different parts of the country and met with a regional expert. Um, so, for example, one of these was I went to Washington, D.C. and met with a guy named Taylor Chamberlain, who's an expert at urban deer hunting, like hunting in the suburbs, hunting in town. And so the idea was each episode, I went to a different place like this, brand new to me. I'd spend a day with that expert, following along with them on a hunt, asking them all the questions like I would ask somebody on a podcast, um, learn as much as I can from them in that one day. And then I would have three more days by myself in this brand new place to try to replicate what I just learned, to try to pull it off myself in this brand new place using this brand new style of hunting. Um, And so I did that in Washington, D.C., I did that um, tracking deer in the snow up in Maine. I did a hunt in Nebraska, trying to learn how to decoy deer on the ground with a handheld decoy on a bow hunt. Um, We did a boating hunt down in Alabama. We did a, uh, we packed in for a backcountry hunt on a mule in Oklahoma, no, Arkansas. Um, And then we did a hunt up in Wisconsin, kind of doing the one traditional kind of hunt, Midwest whitetail hunt, but um, doing a hunt with an outfitter, which I've never done before and always kind of maybe looked down my nose at it. And I figured, well, if I'm going to 
judge anyone. I should probably experience it myself and, and understand what I'm thinking. And that was very interesting and insightful to get to see what that's like and meet with these people. And, um, you know, very cool. So that's deer country. Um, really very hard season for me. That was a tough thing to throw myself into and was uh, very exhausting because I was doing that and filming a season of one week in November. Um, so I'll always look back on that as like a man that burned me out to a crisp, but I'm very proud of the thing, even though like for all sorts of reasons, it was challenging. It, it ended up being something that I think a lot of people learned something from and, and found enjoyable. So that's deer country. Um, and now this year we're doing a different thing where we're all kind of filming films. So instead of doing like a seven part series um, or a five part series or whatever, we're kind of just doing one offs. And so um, I've got a whole bunch of different things planned this fall that um, should be a lot of fun. Hey, everybody. Just wanted to take a moment to tell you about sharing the land. For those unfamiliar, Sharing the Land is an initiative that was brought together by Doug Duran to bring land access seekers and landowners together to form these unions to be able to better benefit the property. Uh, very conservational minded, uh, but it's also about getting people out there and sharing these experiences out on these properties and having them work in a more uniformed way to better benefit the property and the habitat. Um, my company, Map My Ranch, which I, I work with Colin Williams, we make maps for people's properties all around the country, right? And one of the things that we do to be a part of this organization is we offer to make maps for the landowners. So if you sign up as a landowner, we're going to go ahead and put together a map for you, which shows your property, your boundary, and maybe any of the things that you want to have labeled. Uh, maybe it's certain overlooks or maybe it's certain, uh, you know, fencing areas where you're going to have this type of, you know, agricultural work done, or maybe you're going ahead and growing this, you know, maybe these are some native seeds that you're, you're focusing on. Whatever it is that you want to go ahead and have mapped, we're going to do that for you. That's a part of our contribution. Uh, we are a very proud sponsor of sharing the land and will be for a long time. Love working with Doug. Wonderful, wonderful man. And this is a wonderful project. I highly suggest you guys go check it out. And there's a whole team of sponsors and partners that are a part of this that are just top notch. Go check out sharingtheland.com and also go check out dougduran.com to learn more about all the wonderful things he's doing. There's the main Wired Hunt podcast, which is the flagship show where I do long form interviews with folks. And then we have um, the Foundations miniseries, which is hosted by my buddy, Tony Peterson. And so those are short, like 20 minute long, um, basically a monologue. Like he talks to you for 20 minutes about a specific deer hunting topic every Tuesday. And then during the hunting season, we launch another miniseries called Rut Fresh Radio in which we get reports from four or five different hunters from all across the country every week on what they're seeing right now, what the current conditions are, how the weather or the moon or whatever is impacting deer movement, deer activity, what tactics are working right now, what do they think it's going to, how, how are things going to change over the next seven days? What should you be focusing on over the next seven days? Um, so we get that every single week throughout the hunting season. So you're getting play by play ideas and perspective, you know, all through the hunting season. So Starting in September, you've got an episode Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, every week. That's exciting, man. It's a lot of content. It Do you sleep? <laughs> oh, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, I've you... got a, you know, a good team of people that, you know, it's not just me now. And that's been great. Since joining the Mediator team, I've got folks to help out and some resources. So like I said, like Tony helps with one of those mini series and the Rut Fresh Radio one, uh, Tyler Jones and Casey Smith help with that. Um, they do the element as well. So, um, so yeah, having that support makes it all possible. Yeah, no, it, 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 having a great team, man, that's the foundation of everything. And, um, you know, when you were talking about this and, and some of the work with all these different team members and things too, I know that there was a time in 2021 that you, it was just kind of like you were firing on all cylinders. You were kind of, you know, talking about some of the things. And then you wrote an article, um, how I made deer hunting fun again. And talking kind of about your 2021 season and then leading up to your 2022 season and, and what you um, kind of wanted to accomplish. And it sounds like maybe there was that level of, of burnout, maybe that there, you know, I, I kind of want you to talk about that and, you know, not necessarily you have to retell the article, but what was it that you were facing and um, how did you make deer hunting fun again for you in a time when it kind of 
became not fun and, and, and more of a chore or tasks uh, instead of that, you know, excitement that you woke up with every day growing up. Yeah. Well, I think what happened to me, um, and some of this is unique in that hunting is my job, but some of this is not unique to me. Like I've got a lot of hunting buddies who are just diehard deer hunters who have experienced the exact same things, um, despite it not being related to their career at all. Sure. Uh, so a lot of what happened to me was just uh, the pressures and expectations that I placed on myself and how that related to hunting and how that impacted like my experience. Um, so that is kind of like the core of all the problems that led to the burnout in that, you know, I put a, so much pressure to kill a certain caliber of deer or to kill a certain number of deer to have some level of success because I felt like I was supposed to do that or that I, I needed credibility or that I had to prove myself to people. Um, and because of that underlying thing, I would hunt crazy hours, crazy number of days. I travel, you know, I did like nine different States that year, 2021, um, while having a infant and a three-year-old or something. Um, and, you know, trying to do that while running these three podcasts and film two shows and write all the articles and do all these different things. Um, and that I never felt like it was enough. I always felt like I wasn't doing good enough with all those things. And then constantly worrying about, ah, my, you know, for all those reasons, because I'm chasing whatever expectations that I'm thinking I should have for myself and chasing whatever trophy or whatever, um, then I'm not spending time with my family. I'm not spending time with friends. So all my hunting is just like, where can I go to maximize my chance to get the best content or to kill a big deer or whatever? Uh, I don't have time to go to deer camp with my family because you know, we're not going to kill anything there. So I've got to go to Illinois instead, or I've got to go to Iowa instead. Or when I do go to Iowa and a bunch of my hunting buddies are there too, um, they're all coming in and having breakfast together or lunch, or they're all getting together for dinner afterwards and catching up. Um, but can I go? Nope. I'm not coming in. Cause I have to hunt all 13 hours. Cause nothing's more important than killing the big deer. Uh, so I missed out on all those. And can I go to dinner? Nope. I'm not going to go to dinner with everyone because I've got to do this thing. I got to do this article and I want to get to sleep early because I'm getting up at 3am to go hunt all day. And so, you know, went on a hunting trip with a bunch of hunting buddies and never saw the hunting buddies. Um, and so those are just examples of the kinds of things that were compounding over the years, um, all leading up to 2021. As you mentioned, we're all kind of came to a head, just too much of all of that led to, you know, just a lot of it wasn't fun. And I was at some point during that period, I was like, this is ridiculous. Like, this is the thing you love, you know, outside of, you know, your family and everything. Like, this is like your passion, hunting and the outdoors. And somehow now you're miserable doing it. You have to, I, I'm talking to myself, I'm like, you got to figure this out. Like, this is not okay. Um, and and what it came down to, a lot of it was that expectation thing. And if I could, I could, if I could release myself from that and just stop caring about, not that I'm not going to work hard, not that I don't want to achieve my own personal goals and, and do good work and have good hunts. All of those things are absolutely still the case. I'm a very goal oriented person. So that's just who I am. I'm very achievement focused. Um, but learning to focus not just on the end result, but valuing the process just as much so. Um, so all of these things are things that I started trying to incorporate last year. And so number one was just release myself from the pressure of trying to impress anyone or caring about what anybody else thinks. Right. I don't need to be Levi Morgan. I don't need to be Andy May. I don't need to be John Dudley. Um, I'm just going to be me. And that might not be good enough for some people, but that's fine. It, it just needs to be good enough for me and my family and as well. As long as I am focusing on having fun, like doing my thing to the best of my ability and enjoying it the rest will fall into place. And so getting back to stopping, you know, no more expectations, no more giving anyone any influence over me and how I feel about my hunting or what I'm doing, getting back to spending time with friends and family when it comes to hunting, because that's what got me into it. Those are some of the very best moments is sharing these experiences with the people you love, um, getting that back on the table, um, giving myself permission to not be perfect. Um, giving myself permission to come in in the middle of the day and, and have lunch with my kids. Yeah. I'm not going to hunt all day and you're supposed to hunt all day, every day during the rut. You're supposed to be hardcore and grind it out and never say never and never quit and all that stuff. Well, I realized that maybe that's not that important. Maybe coming in and, and seeing my son after school and uh, reading him a story, maybe I'll miss out on a deer, but that's probably a whole lot more important. And, and so I, you know, cliff notes version I started trying to kind of reprioritize and rethink what I'm doing and also 
you know, cut back on some of the travel, cut back on some of these different things, start trying to structure my year and my hunting plans so that it is more conducive for both my family and mental health even. And if I can do yeah. that and just have fun with it, just focus on having fun, um, maybe the results would follow. And lo and behold, you know, going into the last year, that was my focus. My only goals were have fun and take good shots, like no bad shots. I just, that was another thing. I just wanted to continue getting better at reducing mistakes. And uh, man, I had my best hunting season maybe ever uh, oh, from like a tangible nice. way. And then yeah, from an intangible, yeah. without a doubt, an intangible best season ever. Um, and so that's that's kind of where I'm at with things. I know every season is not going to go that well. That's just the nature of hunting. Some years it falls in place, some years it doesn't. Um, but I am dedicated to to sticking to the, those original things that brought me in hunting, sticking here for the love of it, keeping it fun keeping those connections with family and friends alive. And um, I think if you do that, all the rest will take care of itself. Well, I think those things in and of itself become the success story, you know, and then whatever you have in the freezer and on your wall and, you know, the stories and the filming, those, um, those are all a part of it too. But, you know, if you're able to say, I did all the things I wanted to do and you're, you're happy, you don't worry about those expectations of others and you just live your true self, which it sounds like you kind of tapped into something that you needed to at that point in time to kind of be able to take that next step. Cause that there is professional burnout. And I mean, you're a busy man. We just listed all the different things you're a part of. And like you said, you got family and you're going to be, you're mentoring your kids coming into that too. And so you're this example, you want them to see of yeah. how to be in the best way. And it sounds like, you know, you got it all together and um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy for you to hear that you had such a, a successful season and, you know, now we're, you're about to have another one that hopefully is even better than that. Um, yeah. hey, thank you. You're more than welcome, man. Um, I was kind of curious, you know, speaking of leading into a new season, what do you have planned as far as where are you going to be traveling? I know you, you know, obviously you got, uh, you know, working on, on doing some filming and some things with your dad there and getting him his, his bow, uh, you know, every, hunt ready and everything there too. But where are some other places you're going to be traveling and, and some that you're kind of look, some hunts you're really looking forward to this fall? Yeah. So kind of going back to restructuring some of my work things to, to better fit those priorities. Um, I've shifted, you know, a lot of my, some of my content, at least, if not a lot of it away from just like, what's a hunt I can go do that's going to give me the best chance to kill big deer mm -hmm. to instead, how do I do the things that matter to me and how can I tell a good story around those? So for example, one of my films that I'm going to get do, as I said, is like, I'm not even hunting. I'm going to go with my dad and try to help him get a deer up at our cabin and tell the story of our deer camp and that history and family tradition. Um, and that's what I'm really excited about. And I want to be able to spend time up there at that very special place. And I want to be able to spend time with my dad. And there's a compelling story there to tell that I think people will really enjoy. Um, and that's like unique to, to me and what I can bring to the table. So that's an example of what I'm trying to do more of. So I'm doing that, I'm doing, um, a film about my local close to home hunts. So again, something I can do with my family. I can be here at home. Um, I can tell those local Michigan stories, with some of my favorite hunts of the year, hunting the deer, you know, right here in my general neighborhood where I live. Um, mm -hmm. but I haven't filmed them in a number of years. So I'm going to tell that story, um, I'm going to do a new film this year about the back 40 and showcase that story. I just mentioned to you about those two uh, mentees that I've been helping get into hunting. Um, I'm going to go back out with them on the back 40, spend a few days hunting together with them, hopefully help them get their first buck with a bow while also telling the story of everything that's happened since we donated the property. Um, so again, not even me hunting. One of yeah. my films will be helping some other people. Um, and then my own like, that I will be doing, I'm taking two trips. One of them will be to Minnesota and Wisconsin. And that's going to be kind of this upper Great Lakes road trip. Um, just kind of talking about back to what we have just spent the last 10 minutes talking about, which is this whole epiphany I had in 2021 and the idea of just having fun. And I want this film to kind of talk about that journey that I went on where I kind of burned out and realized like I got to set aside the expectations and get back to just doing some things that are fun and having an experience and enjoying the landscape and people. So I'm going to go up to the Boundary Waters region of Minnesota, spend some time with some friends and go fishing and camping. And then we're going to continue down the road and meet up with my buddy, Doug Duran, our mutual friend, Doug Duran, and hunt down there with him for a few days and, uh, and just have some fun, see some places in my general upper Great Lakes region do some fishing, do some camping, do some deer hunting and, uh, and, and showcase just the fact that you can have a great adventure. It doesn't have to be a 
a Booner assassination trip. You can go out and, right. and have an, ex, an experience with people that you care about and see beautiful places and, and hopefully kill a deer and, and blow, boat some fish. Um, mm-hmm. But it's it's the process and the journey and the people that really make it special. So that's one. And then I do have like one just like standard going after some big deer in Nebraska rut hunt, um, which is fun still to do too. That's great, man. It sounds like a, a wonderful season. I, I like how you have a mixture of things there too and different projects. I think that'll keep it fresh for you and especially, you know, the ones that are going to hit close to home with working with your family there and, you know, all that, that, and, and being able to, you know, hunt around your house and kind of keep your kids in, in, involved with, you know, your yeah. experiences on a day to day. It's exciting stuff. Um, yeah. You know, I've, I've been approached with this uh, with, with some friends and I've always been curious and I wanted to hear your take. When do you, decide you're going to get your kids into hunting i mean i know that there's a there's a progression that let, let's say you've already done you know hunting uh safety firearm safety and everything when do you feel is a good time um and i know it's maybe whenever the kid is ready but do you have an idea of whenever you're going to get uh your kiddo behind uh you know a rifle or to get in that first hunt or maybe it's bow maybe your, your kids jumping onto that that level already but when do you think that you see that where y'all are going to be going in the stands uh, or in the woods together? Yeah. So they're already going out in the woods with me, you know, right. from early age. Um, so that's, that's been building the foundation. My oldest started going turkey hunting with me when he was two. Well, really not. We were out walking around calling the birds when he was in my little chest pack uh, at six months or whatever, however old he was. Um, but he was turkey hunting with me at two, at three years old, he sat with me in the deer blind for the first time. And last year four, we went on like eight, nine, 10 hunts. Um, so he was with me a lot and, and that was very cool. So this year he's super gung ho is at five. He thinks he can shoot a deer himself. Now he, uh, he's, he's constantly like, dad, I can do it. I can do it. But I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure what the right age will be for him to do it himself. Um, he, both the boys this year, my youngest is going to go out with me for the first time too. He's going to get to go to deer camp for a day. Um, and so we're going to do that together for a number of more years. Um, to your point, I'm going to say the thing you didn't want me to say, it'll depend on when the child's ready, but, um, you know, we don't have a minimum age anymore here in Michigan. Like when I was growing up, it was like 12 or 13. If I, if I remember it, when I could bow hunt and then it wasn't until I was like 16, I think maybe that I could gun hunt somewhere in that ballpark. Um, so now it's just whenever the parent wants. Right. So I'm guessing somewhere between that eight and 10 year range, maybe would, would maybe be whenever my oldest, um, brings a weapon with him. Mm-hmm. He's got a BB gun. He got a BB gun for his fifth birthday. He's a menace with it. He loves it. He's uh, <laughs> constantly taking it out and, um, keeping the local bird population unnoticed. Yep. Uh, yep. So, uh, so he's definitely taken to that and loves shooting his bow. He wants a compound bow this year. So I think I'm going to get him one of those little kid compounds. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so he's, he's well on his way, but I want to make sure he's mentally ready for it. Um, and that we're just going to have to see. Um, but I'm guessing someone that eight to 10 year range could quite, you know, could be, could be possible. Yeah. Well, you know, cause I asked you, my daughter's 10 and she's a crack shot, but it's like one of those things I always, I think I was 10 or maybe right at 11 when I, when I went out and I, you know, had a deer rifle at a six millimeter to my shoulder and, and took my first deer. Um, and, but I had taken some smaller game and things along the way, you know, there's that progression of course too. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I understand that there's going to be things that your kiddos will do too, as they're kind of getting up to that point. But I've always been curious. Right. Cause that's something that, 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 you know, a lot of my friends with kids are around that age are like, you know, when, when do we, you know, and it always is when that kid's ready to, but yeah, I was kind of curious yeah. what your take was. So, um, yeah, I, I'm still figuring it out. I've been asking yeah. that same question myself a lot, but, but he's ready. Everett's ready to go. He, he thinks he is. He certainly <laughs> thinks he is. <laughs> he's like, can he I take it. him with the BB gun? <laughs> yeah. He, uh, he's asked me, like, can I kill the other BB gun? And then he, now he's keeping on asking for a 22. Cause he's found out that's like the next step. And so right. he's, he's asking that I can I kill the other 22. Like, well, I mean, if you perfectly place that bullet me right in the eyeball down to the brain, maybe so, but uh, we're not going to try that. <laughs> it's frowned upon by a lot uh-huh. of state agencies as well. Yes. We're not going to go that route. <laughs> so I was kind of curious, it, it, you know, thinking about hunting still and everything with, you know, if it's not whitetail, what are your other species that you love to hunt? Or is it fishing that is the close second? What is it that, that kind of really brings you out to the outdoors and passion aside from whitetail deer? Yeah. So definitely my closest number two is fishing. 
Um, I love fly fishing. Um, really, it's got a, a tight squeeze on me. So that's been a great kind of yin to the yang of my whitetail thing. So mm -hmm. spring and summer, I do a ton of fishing. Um, and then by the time like July or August comes around, then I am able to refocus on whitetails and I'm fully recharged and was able to turn my brain off of whitetail mode for a little bit. Um, so yeah, you know, fly fishing for trout is my bread and butter, but I've been expanding out and doing some different things, doing some salt water. And that's been a lot of fun. I'd love to do more of that. Um, and as far as hunting, like I really enjoy turkey hunting, um, mm -hmm. but I'm not that guy who goes and like travels all over the country, turkey hunting. I'll kill, you know, kill a bird here in Michigan and some years go to one other state, maybe. Um, and I'd like to do more elk hunting. I hunted, I've hunted elk a good number of times, but haven't been able to the last few years because of all the the deer show stuff I've been doing. Um, but I miss the, that. I really enjoy that. So want to get, get some more elk hunts here in the near future too. That sounds uh, wonderful, man. Good luck with that. And you know, it's at it, any time is out in the woods is a good time, no matter what you're chasing, but it's, it's fun to kind of, I'm sure switch it up for you, but um, you've hunted on, and I, I assume there's almost every state now it you're probably closing in on a list, right? Like how many States have you hunted whitetail deer in now? It's a lot. It's not, there's more than I haven't. Um, I had to figure out the number the other day for a video we did. It's something like 18 or 20 states, maybe somewhere in that ballpark. Um, wow. So, yeah, I mean, I've seen a bunch, but there's a whole bunch still to yeah. visit. Yeah, more to more to do. Yeah. Um, there was something that I remember listening very early on to your podcast. You talked about how your two favorite types of music were electronic music and country <laughs> music. Is that still the case today? I would say that I, I don't think I have a favorite anymore would be the answer. I would uh -huh. say like they have both maybe like went down a little bit and everything uh -huh. else has kind of come up a little bit. And now I just have a bunch of different stuff. So I do absolutely still like electronic dance music. I still like country, but I also like uh folk and indie. I like alternative rock. I like um, jazz and like old standards. Like it just depends on kind of like the mood and the time of sure. year. Sure. Um, like the summer we'll probably listen to a lot of country and then and then like folk also where i am so like when i oh go yeah out, we we have we spend a lot of time out west in idaho and wyoming and i'm out there it's either like uh maybe like tyler childers kind of stuff or coulter wall kind of like country ish um but then it also might be like folk rock out there and then when i'm back here like in the fall like a lot of like you know it's dark early. There's a fire on. Some Frank Sinatra just seems right for a lot of those days. And then, uh, you know, EDM is great during hunting season when I'm trying to get like woken up and amped up in the morning, heading out to hunt in the rut. Yeah. So uh, I'm very eclectic, very eclectic musical taste. Well, you used to have a CD. Was it called Rut Rave? <laughs> Didn't you yeah. have something that was kind of your pump up jam? Yeah. That Do was, you still that was... have that in a in a now digital format that you're you're turning back into? I, every year since I started using Spotify, which was probably back in like, I don't know, somewhere in the mid teens, um, I've had a rut and rave playlist every year. And so, yeah, I could go like, I've, I've, I've threatened to share them online for people to, to check out. Cause I do like in October, I'll start like going through different uh, EDM playlists and start pulling together my favorites for the year. And, uh, and yes, I have, I have those still to this day. You're going to have to send that to me. So I, I, for 10 years, toured around with an EDM band. We were a live drum and bass band. And so nice. that was something that when I heard that, I was like, that's awesome. There's not a lot of other folks that I've met in the hunting industry <laughs> yeah. that have a passion for EDM and also country music. I mean, here from Texas, I mean, that's kind yeah. of, you know, it's, they, they filter that into your, your, your bottle, oh, yeah. you know, it's something that you have to absorb. And, um, sure. but I have a, an eclectic group. So I was like, I bet you I'm going to be jamming to that, that rut rave mix. So you're going to have yeah. to share that playlist sometime, man. I got to hear I'll it. get that out there for you. Yeah. And, I'll, and if you still have a CD player, I'll send you one of mine, you know, <laughs> so you can hear that. <laughs> I, I found, I found an old, uh, like the binders that you used to have of yeah. CDs. Oh yeah. And I, I was looking through that and I thought to myself, I don't want to get rid of these because it's so nostalgic, but I don't have a way to play it. Like, what do I do with these? Do I just hold on to them as like relics of the past? But um it's a tough yeah. choice because I took them from the case to moving into the binders and I, I have mm -hmm. them in the corner of my office over here. And I don't there's like a thousand of them in different <laughs> binders and such. And yeah. I thought, what do I do? They're probably have already corroded, you know, and they're yeah. not playable, but I've digitized them all and I'm like, 
do I recycle these? What do you do? I have no yeah, idea. But there's someday I'll have like some giveaway and like I'll just like ship that to someone. Like, Why'd you do this? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> it's a new world. <laughs> it is. It is, man. Totally different growing up than what yeah. we had. Even just like hearing that, I remember just like thinking about the, the the idea of a CD. You know, how many people would be like, "What's that these days?" You're like, "Yeah, you don't even know." Yeah, my don't kids remember, like, have no clue. Or like the pencils rewinding and like the tape. They, you know, the things that you learn as a kid that yeah. they'll have no clue. No, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the good old days. Well, speaking of the good old days, let's finish this out with, I want you to talk about your legacy, what you want to leave behind, you know, personally, professionally, I know you got a lot to choose from there, but like, what is it that, that you want to kind of be known for and remembered as, um, you know, and, you know, I remember someone talking about like the three things that you want on like your, your, your gravestone kind of the idea, like what are the three, maybe main words you want people to remember, whether it's son, whether it's father, whether it's brother, friend. Um, but you know, more than that, if you can expand on your idea of, you know, what it is that, you know, you want to leave behind as your legacy. Yeah. I, I think this has evolved for me over the last, you know, 15 years, um, where originally it was just like, I wanted to make a living doing what I love. Um, and, you know, as we kind of alluded to with that story of my career trajectory and that like mid teens kind of time period, 2015, 16, somewhere in there, I started, you know, thinking more and more about, you know, trying to make a difference. And that has continued to evolve to the point where now like my main legacy that I want to leave when I'm all said and done, at least professionally, um, is, you know, I want to have made, a large scale positive difference on the future of hunting, fishing, and, and wildlife and wild places. Um, so I want to use my platform and whatever stuff I can bring to the table to uh, to make this place better than it was. And to hopefully, you know, when people look back, I don't care if they think I'm the best deer hunter or that I was the best podcaster or I was, you know, I had the most YouTube views or anything like that. Um, I would just like to be really impactful when it comes to the resource and to our tradition and our lifestyle. Um, if if that's the case, if my gravestone says that I made hunting, fishing, wildlife, and wild places better um, in a real significant, real meaningful way, um, professionally, that would be the legacy I'd like to leave. And then as far as being a parent and a husband, I just want to do as best as I can by my boys and my wife. And um you know, hopefully inspire them to continue that kind of work and, and be positive contributors to, uh, to this wonderful world we have. All right. Great answers, Mark. Great answers. Thanks for sharing that. And, you know, thanks for joining me today and, and kind of walking through your career and the different projects you got going on. Uh, it's been an honor to have you on and, you know, I'd encourage everybody to go and follow you and uh, kind of check out all these shows. If we can just kind of give a recap, where can people learn, um, you know, about what you're doing? I mean, obviously Wired to Hunt and through Meat Eater, where are some other, you know, channels and, and you know, your socials, if you wouldn't mind giving those out? Yeah. So um, you can find a podcast anywhere podcasts are published. So Wired to Hunt will get you all of those sub series. So if you subscribe to the main Wired to Hunt podcast, those other two that I mentioned are all populated there. Um, my Instagram handle is at wired to hunt. And that's the most, uh, that's where I'm the most active when it comes to social media, share a lot of different, you know, updates from my own adventures and experiences and tips and segments from the podcast and different things like that. Um, as far as my, uh, written articles and deer hunting content, things like that, the meat is our site where all of my stuff's published. There is, excuse me, there is a wired hunt section of the meat eater website, which has all of our like hardcore whitetail stuff. So definitely check that out. When you go there, you'll be prompted to join our wired to hunt weekly newsletter. So if you're a whitetail person, definitely sign up for that newsletter. Cause every week I send a little note about what's on my mind and then all of our latest whitetail content. Um, so that's how to stay up to date on everything that's going on on that side of things. Um, and then the meat eater YouTube channel is where all these different shows are that I mentioned and the new ones coming down the line. Well, great, man. Sounds like a, a lot of wonderful things to come. I've enjoyed all the content you put out uh, thus in forth. And I, I want to encourage people also uh, to go check out your book, uh, That Wild Country. It's phenomenal. You know, he told you where you can get it. I'll have links below for everything for uh, all your socials as well. And uh, once again, Mark, thank you so much for joining. And I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful season and can't wait to hear about your dad getting that, uh, that bow buck there this year. Yeah. Hey, you're welcome. And thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. And yeah, let's all cross cross our fingers for for Mr. David Kenyon. It's going to be an yes. exciting exciting year up there. So thank you. Good deal, man. Well, you take care. 
Dicevo.